After completing this chapter, the learner will be familiar with the configuration of a typical basic diesel engine cooling water system. Be familiar with the configuration of the other cooling systems for a diesel engine. As we have already seen from the previous chapter, we have to cool the components and systems of a diesel engine if we wish to operate continuously for long periods. We can achieve this by circulating a primary coolant, which will take the heat from the engine components, and then circulating the primary and a secondary coolant through a heat exchanger to remove the heat from the primary coolant. Having completed Chapter One, you should now be aware of which coolants are suitable for the various cooling requirements. In this chapter, we will look at the different cooling systems that you are likely to be dealing with when you are operating large diesel engines. A diesel engine jacket water cooling system must be able to take away the heat transferred into the cylinder components during the combustion process. To achieve this, it must circulate a suitable coolant, usually fresh water, through the cooling spaces provided. These cooling spaces will usually be around the cylinder liner. And inside the cylinder cover, the jacket water system may also serve the exhaust valve cages and turbocharger casing for those designs that require cooling. The sketch shows a basic jacket water system using fresh water as the primary coolant and sea water as the secondary coolant. The fresh water will normally enter at the lower part of the liner and exit from the cylinder cover. Don't worry at this stage if you are not familiar with the details and purpose of all of the components. As we will look at these individually in a later chapter. Obviously, not every diesel engine jacket cooling water system is operated with exactly the same parameter values. There are certain to be differences between systems due to different designs and choice of materials for the various engine components. Also, sea water temperatures will vary due to the geographical area that the ship is operating in. The values given in the table are typical for a large two-stroke diesel engine. You may find that the temperature of the jacket water may be 15 degrees Celsius or more higher for some small, high-powered diesel engines. You should make yourself familiar with the actual values of the parameters for all of the cooling systems for the diesel engines on the ships you are sailing with, as part of your familiarization with the engine plant. Although the primary purpose of a jacket water system is to cool the diesel engine, it can also serve as secondary function by providing a preheating facility for the engine. This is particularly necessary when preparing the engine for a first start in cold climates, in order to minimize thermal stresses. The other cooling systems included in this module will have a preheat facility. The diesel engine requires the heat of compression of the air in the cylinder to provide the ignition source for the fuel. To help achieve this, the engine cylinder can be warmed using a jacket water preheating system. The heating for the jacket cooling water can be provided by a subcircuit of the main system using electrical heating elements or steam heating coils. Some systems use the heat from the auxiliary engine cooling system to preheat the main system by using suitable crossover arrangements. What arrangements do you have on your ship at present? If you are unsure, you should check it out next time you are in the engine room. Different jacket water cooling systems will have different layouts and valve arrangements. The principles of operation, however, will be the same. Before starting the system, the header tank level should be checked and adjusted as necessary, and all of the valves should be correctly set for preheating. Once the pumps are started, the valves should be adjusted to regulate the flow, so as to ensure correct temperatures throughout the system. When the temperature of the system has reached the required level and all other required conditions met, the engine can be started and the preheating shut off. Temperatures and flow are usually monitored at each cylinder. The temperature control in modern systems is usually an automatic function, and in the system shown, it is controlled by a three-way valve. We will look at automatic control in more detail later in the module. You should familiarize yourself with the system on the ship that you are on, including the means used to manually regulate the temperature in the event of control function failure. 
This applies to all of the systems for the equipment that you may be involved with. As well as the cylinder cover and cylinder liner, the pistons also heat up due to the combustion process. They also receive some heat due to friction between piston rings and liner and piston skirt and liner. Even though, when operating correctly, these surfaces are separated by an oil film, frictional heat is still generated and transferred between components. In large, slow-speed engines, the pistons are usually cooled by a separate system to the jacket water. The coolant mainly used for this is oil from the main lubricating oil system, though some older systems used fresh water. The preference for oil is due to the risk of coolant leakage into the crankcase, as was stated earlier. Trunk piston engines use lubricating oil, either circulated through the piston crown or splashed up in the crankcase as a piston coolant. With water as the coolant, a so-called cocktail shaker effect is often used to optimize the cooling effect on the piston. The cooling chambers are designed to be half full, and the reciprocating motion of the piston causes the water to be thrown onto the underside of the piston crown as if it was a cocktail shaker. Most of the large two-stroke engines that you will sail with will have oil-cooled pistons. Certainly, the majority of recently built engines will use oil as the coolant. However, there are still many engines in service which were designed for water cooling of the pistons. The values given in the table are typical for a large two-stroke diesel engine. One of the main large two-stroke engine manufacturers used the piston cooling system for cooling the turbocharger rather than the jacket water system. Since it was felt that the temperatures and the pressures for the system were better suited, again make yourself familiar with the actual values of the parameters for the systems on the ships you are sailing with as part of your familiarization with the engine plant. Before starting the system, the drain tank level should be checked and adjusted as necessary. The tank should also be checked for any oil contamination. Typically, the cooling water is supplied to and returned from the pistons via telescopic pipes. The telescopic pipes are arranged so that the sealing glands are outside of the crankcase to minimize the risk of contaminating the lubricating oil system. It is necessary to monitor these sealing glands for leakage. Once the tank is at normal level and the valves have been correctly set, the pump can be started. Continuous flow of cooling water through each piston is essential for continued operation, and sight glasses are normally fitted in the return pipes so that flow can be monitored. The temperature is usually monitored at each cylinder, and the cooler bypass is used to adjust it. This basic system shows the temperature being manually controlled. Click on the button to see the operation of the system. The location in the cylinder head and the exposure of the injector nozzle to the combustion chamber mean that excess heat has to be removed to avoid seizure of the needle valve and overheating of the fuel within the fuel injection valve. Any failure of the system, such as blockage or scale deposits, would cause the fuel injection valves to overheat and seize, or lead to carbon deposits inside the valves due to overheating of the fuel. Having an additional system means increased cost and maintenance. Other common problems associated with these systems include contamination of the coolant with fuel due to leakages within the fuel injection valves and corrosion of valve bodies. To avoid the problems associated with fuel valve cooling systems, engine manufacturers have developed their engine designs to avoid the need for such systems. If you are on ships with older engines, you may still come across fuel valve cooling systems. The type of fuel that the engine operates on will influence the cooling arrangements for the fuel injection valves. Click on the action buttons to learn more about this. For some engines operating on distillate fuel, the risk of overheating of fuel injection valves due to transfer of residual heat when the engine was first stopped meant that a separate cooling system was necessary. 
During normal load operation, the flow of the relatively cold fuel was sufficient to maintain acceptable temperatures. Some systems combine the cooling for fuel injection valves and exhaust valve cages. Fresh water is used as the coolant. Oil or fresh water could be used for fuel valve cooling where these systems are separate. By fitting an additional heat exchanger, the system could also be used to maintain valve temperatures when operating at low load to avoid possible cold corrosion problems. This heating facility would also be used to preheat the fuel in the injection valves to improve starting of a cold engine. For engines using heavy fuel oil, the fuel injection valves require positive cooling since the hot fuel means that the valves are at a higher temperature. Either a separate cooling system or some means to ensure continuous flow of the fuel through the injector bodies to remove excess heat is necessary. Where a separate cooling system is fitted, oil or fresh water can be used as the coolant. With this type of system, it is normal to change from heavy to distillate fuel, allowing plenty of time to clear the lines of all of the heavy fuel before the engine was stopped. A heating facility is usually included to maintain temperatures at low load and for pre-start. Current practice is to have automatic recirculation of the fuel through the valves when the engine is stopped. This allows acceptable temperatures to be maintained even with hot, heavy fuel oils. You will possibly have some experience of this type of arrangement if you have worked with heavy fuel burning engines built in the last 20 years. Most diesel engines that you will sail with will be designed to operate without separate cooling of the fuel injection valves. Instead, they will use either recirculation of the fuel or cylinder cover design to achieve the required cooling. However, there are still many engines in service which were designed with separate valve cooling systems. The values given in the table are typical for a large two-stroke diesel engine and will be similar for many four-stroke engines. Again, make yourself familiar with the actual values of the parameters for the systems on the ships you are sailing with as part of your familiarization with the engine plant. With the system filled and the tank level correct, the pump can be started once the discharge and system valves are set to circulate the cooling water. Prior to starting the engine, the fuel valve coolant is heated by passing it through the preheater. This heats up the injectors and the fuel contained in them close to normal operating temperatures, which makes starting easier. Once the cooling system temperature exceeds normal levels, the preheater is shut off and the temperature can be controlled by adjusting the cooler bypass. When operating continuously on low load, it may be necessary to maintain temperatures by using the preheater. Again, the temperature control can be either manual or automatic. Because of the high risk of fuel contamination of the cooling water in this type of system, the system tank should be checked regularly during operation. Diesel engines that are designed to operate without any pressure charging of the combustion air are referred to as naturally aspirated. This type of design is usually restricted to engines for emergency duties. It is likely that you will have some engines of this type on board your vessel now, for example the lifeboat engines or emergency fire pump engine. The vast majority of diesel engines that you sail with will be pressure charged, usually using an exhaust gas driven turbocharger. The purpose of pressure charging a diesel engine is to increase the mass of air in the cylinder and so allow greater power to be developed by burning a greater quantity of fuel than would be possible with a naturally aspirated engine. The air delivered to the engine by a turbocharger or other compressor device will be hot due to the compression process. It is not uncommon for the air temperature to exceed 100 degrees Celsius at the exit from the turbocharger compressor. At this temperature, the air density is low and the mass for a given volume quite small. To increase the effective mass of air in the cylinder, it is necessary to cool the air to increase the density before it enters the engine. 
The purpose of the charge air cooler, or intercooler as it is referred to on some engines, is to reduce the air temperature to the required level. Typically, the air temperature at inlet to the engine will be in the range of 35 degrees Celsius to 50 degrees Celsius. In order to achieve the relatively low air temperatures required at the engine inlet, the coolant temperature has to be lower than the final air temperature. This means that the jacket cooling water cannot be used, and many engines therefore use seawater as the primary coolant for charge air cooling. When seawater is used as the primary coolant, a direct feed from the main seawater system is supplied to the charge air cooler. Either a three-way valve or a bypass valve in parallel with the charge air cooler is used to regulate the air temperature. You will see later in the module that where a central cooling system is employed, it is possible to use the fresh water from the low temperature circuit to cool the charge air. As indicated in an earlier section, some medium and high speed engines have separate cooling water systems for the exhaust valve cages. This may be combined with the fuel valve cooling water system. For large two stroke engines, cooling of the exhaust valve cages is usually an extension of the main jacket cooling water system. For the majority of modern engines, exhaust valve cage cooling is achieved using the main jacket water system by either circulating the jacket water through balls in the cage or by the position of the cooling spaces in the cylinder cover. There are also some engine designs which have water cooling for the exhaust manifold, although this is not very common. We have seen that it is preferable to use fresh water as the primary coolant for the engine jacket cooling system. We have also seen that seawater can be used as the secondary coolant for the jacket water and other cooling systems. We will also see later in the module how seawater usage can be kept to a minimum by employing a central cooling system. In practice, where seawater is used as the secondary coolant, it is normal to arrange the seawater to flow through the heat exchangers of the various engine systems in series. With this arrangement, the seawater flows through the heat exchanger for the system with the lowest required temperature before passing to the next one. It is not normally possible to arrange the charge air cooling in this way, and this is usually fed directly from the seawater main. Each heat exchanger is fitted with a bypass valve to control individual system temperatures while still ensuring the required seawater flow for cooling the other systems. Sometimes provision is made to feed the jacket water system from the seawater system in the event of loss of fresh water. This facility should be regarded as a short term emergency means of operation, and when cooled this way, the engine would be operated at reduced load. To reduce the risk of accidental admission of seawater to the system, the cross connections are normally provided with locked valves or blanking plates. Obviously, the seawater temperature will vary depending on where in the world the ship is operating. The temperature range for seawater is from sub zero up to about 38 degrees Celsius. The majority of engines are designed to operate with a minimum seawater temperature of about 10 degrees Celsius. To achieve this, the system will usually be fitted with a recirculation facility, with part of the water in the system being returned to the pump suction rather than being discharged overboard. The recirculation, and therefore the minimum temperature, can be controlled with a three way valve. Using either manual or automatic adjustment. Seawater system pressure is usually in the range of 2 to 3 bar gauge pressure, with the actual value dictated by the vertical position of the coolers relative to the pump outlet and the valve and piping arrangement. After opening shipside low suction and overboard valves, suction strainer inlet and outlet valves, pump suction valve, and the bypass and inlet valves on each cooler. One of the seawater pumps can be started with the discharge valve partly open. Once the pump has run up, then the discharge valve can be fully opened. Once the engine is started, the temperatures of the individual systems can be controlled by using the cooler outlet and bypass valves to give the required seawater flow through each cooler. In practice, the outlet and bypass functions are usually combined by using an automatic three way valve on the primary fluid. Which avoids the need to manually balance the individual valves to maintain correct flow in the seawater system. We will look at automatic control later in the module. Many smaller diesel engines are arranged with integral services and systems, including the cooling water systems. Some small diesel engines may be seawater cooled, for example, lifeboat engines, although fresh water is always the preferred option. 
With these arrangements, the cooling water pumps, as well as other service pumps such as lubricating oil and fuel oil, are normally mounted on and driven by the engine. In some cases, small electric-driven pumps are provided for first start and standby requirements. The heat exchangers for the various services are also usually engine-mounted on this type of engine. It is probable that the auxiliary engines on your ship have an arrangement similar to this. The heat, which is carried away by the jacket water, as we have seen, originates partly from the combustion of fuel in the cylinder. When the heat is transferred from the jacket water to sea water, then the heat is wasted. It is just dumped into the sea. If any of the heat can be used for a productive purpose, then the overall plant efficiency can be improved. One common means of achieving this is to use the heat from the jacket water to heat the feed and the generating element for a fresh water generator. This reduces the cost of fresh water production on board, as no additional fuel is required to provide the necessary heat energy. Using the jacket water in this way also means that the fresh water generator is being used as a cooler for the engine jacket water cooling system. The full operating details of the fresh water generator are outside of the scope of this module, and you should refer to CBT module 0098 for more information on this piece of equipment if you are not familiar with it. In this chapter, we have looked at all of the cooling water systems which may be required to allow continuous operation of a diesel engine. The systems for any particular engine will be determined by the actual design of that engine. The systems we have considered have all used seawater as the secondary coolant. This probably seems logical to you, as there is plenty of it, and it is normally relatively cold. Using seawater, however, means that the systems are subject to scaling, fouling, and corrosion. Which not only affect the efficiency of the system, but also increases downtime and maintenance costs. Minimizing the use of seawater as a secondary coolant also minimizes these adverse effects. We will see in a later chapter that separate systems are no longer the preferred choice. It is now common with modern designs to use central cooling systems with fresh water as the primary and secondary coolant for most cooling duties. And only a simple seawater circuit for final heat removal. We will consider this in more detail in a later chapter.